So for today, we'll start a new chapter. The chapter is, name is uh, Seismic Refraction. I think it's chapter six in your book. So refer to the book if you are interested, uh, but the majority of the questions and, uh, in the exams, also in the quizzes are from the slides and from my lectures. So please watch my lectures. I keep uploading them to YouTube. Speed up, make it um, 1.5 the speed or 1.25. So you don't, you don't waste your time. This is a new chapter. It's different than the seismology. It, ha it got a lot of application in mining, in civil engineering, in agricultural studies as well. So the refraction technique is useful, but it's not used in oil industry. The technique, the seismic technique, which is used in oil industry is actually seismic refraction. Let me switch off this one because it will annoy me. So what's seismic ref refraction? How, how it's used, that's actually uh, the topic of this chapter. We talked about seismic rays and waveforms, and we, they, we say that they have a relationship. They are orthogonal to each other's. Seismic rays or ray paths are imaginary things. They are not the real thing, which is the actual thing happening in the subsurface is wavefronts. The energy expands in every direction. If the Earth is homogeneous, the ray travel at the same speed with the same distance at each specific time. But the Earth usually is made up of different layers each layer have its own velocity and we can trace actually the ray path using something called Snell's law we discussed Snell's law in our previous chapter and the Snell's law is actually as stated here in terms of equation is sign of incident angle over the velocity of the overlying layer this equals to what it equals to the sign of the underlying layer or the which direction the wave moves divided by v2 which is the velocity of the second layer this is the snell's law so what happens if i keep increasing or there there is some angle where the ray is actually actually traveling parallel to the interface. The refracted ray angle is 90 degree. This is what we call critical refraction. That's actually what's called critical refraction. And the principle of refraction methods it depends on critically refracted rays. So critically refracted rays are rays whenever the angle of refraction is 90 degrees from the normal. So this angle is 90 degree. So waves usually whenever they propagate, if we assume that this is a source and the waves are propagating in each direction, At some certain angle, we call this angle critical angle, IC. We call this angle critical angle. What's what the specific thing or what the interesting thing about this angle is that the refracted ray will travel parallel to the interface. And that's is actually the principle of a refraction technique. So how it happens, let's move on. Whenever there is interface, as we said, uh, there is a mood conversion. The P wave, whenever it moves to a different layers, it generates other wave types too. So the incident P wave will generate also S wave reflected and refracted s wave so we need also to differentiate here between normal and refraction so this is a refraction or transmission that's a 
normal refraction, and there is also critical refraction. The critical refraction whenever the wave or the angle of refraction is 90 degrees. That's what we call critical refraction. So if I ask a question on what the critical angle depends on, what are the parameters it depends on? Actually, it depends only on the velocity of the respective layers. The respective layers in this context is the upper and the lower velocities of the layers, the two layers. The mood conversion, these things, whenever the P wave is changing to S wave, part of it is changing to S wave, happens only at oblique angles. That's actually a loop oblique, oblique angle. The angle whenever the incident ray is not normal. At normal, that angle going to be zero. So what creates waves actually? How waves propagate whenever there is a barrier? How I myself hear myself or someone else even if there is a small hole in the wall. How my sound waves goes or propagate through this hole? It follows a principle called Huygens principle. Huygens principle states that whenever the wave is propagating, it excites each particle on its wave front and the new particle or that particle will act as a source of new wave. And thus the wave propagate or expand or move forward. Each particle in each direction is excited. It's generating its own waves and the wave will interfere either destructively or constructively. And the constructive, constructive interference will let the wave move forward. So in geophysics, whenever there is a sharp boundary like that, we expect diffraction. We expect something called diffracted energy. Even though the wave, for example, is coming from up down, that's the incident wave front, the wave, some part of the wave will image this part. The, a wave can go to, the, to, the, to this part of the rock, which is below or hidden beneath, for example, this, let's say it's cavity. In the cavity, waves cannot move quite good, even though we can image it. And that's how they image, for example, rocks below salt, salt layers. Seismic can image rocks below salts. So the hygiene principle is actually the principle which lets wave do critical refraction. Waves which are critically refracted be reflected back to the surface or diffracted back to the surface are recorded. In general, what's hygiene principle? Hygiene principle states that whenever there is a wave moving in one direction, it's moving in a medium. That medium is made up of particles or atoms. Each particle will act as a new source of energy, radiating energy in each direction, radiating waves in each direction. And those waves have amplitudes. Amplitude and energy are related to each other. The higher the energy of the wave, the higher the amplitude I record. The seismic traces will have then higher amplitudes. It's a manifestation that the energy was high. The earthquake probably was of high magnitude. Or the way you hit the ground with a hammer, you hit it with a great impact. So they move in each direction, and each point is actually generating its own waves spherically in every direction. They either can interfere constructively or destructively. That's the reason you don't see them, for example, in the same layer, you don't see them returning back. 
Why they are not returning back in the same layer? Because they are interfering destructively. But they move forward. In the forward direction, they interfere constructively and let the waveform move a step forward. So that's uh, what's hygiene principle. It's actually discovered by a scientist, a, just, a judge, uh, Dutch scientist actually. And it states that every point acts as small sort of source that generate its own waves. Waves are, as I said, circular, moving in each direction. They can either interfere constructively or destructively. So let's say that a planar wave is moving from down to up, as is the case you see in this slide. So those are the particle. They can be as many as you like. But for simplification, we made them um, just few of them or few points. But they can be as much as you like. So each point having its own spherical wavelets. And we are assuming this medium, let's assume it's a rock of a, of a homogeneous layer having the same velocity. So the ray, each point creates a waveform, its own waveform, and we name them wavelets. So in this part, for example, they are interfering destructively, but in this part, they are interfering constructively. And this is how the wave moved a step forward. That's the wave front. So as you know, the wave is uh, something which is similar to the waves you see on the sea. It's half peaks and troughs. So if the peak moved, behind the peak is usually what? What do you see behind a peak? If there is a wave moving. That's the highest point, we call it peak or highest amplitude. Behind it, there is, are you following along with me? Throw. Yes. Trough, trough they name it. They name it the trough. So behind it, there is a trough or what we call as trough. So this is a trough. This is what we call as a trough. And that's how the wave moves. It keeps expanding, moving, and that's what we see as a new wave front. The wave front expand moving. And always there is behind it a trough. So this is a simple uh, animation. Let's say me, myself, and this guy here is trying to speak to me. Since sound, sound waves, they can easily diffract. I can hear them, but I need something. He keeps speaking to me without sending the thing I want. I cannot hear him. I can only hear him if there is diffractions, if there is wavelets. Those wavelets are actually generated because of Huygens principle. Because each wave front is made up of different particles and each particle is generating its own energy in all direction. So this is a new wave front. And it keeps expanding because they are new one in here. They generate waveform in all direction, circular waveforms. And the one, if it's in here, it also generate waveform in all direction. In some parts, they interfere destructively, but in other parts, they interfere constructively and a new waveform is generated. This is how it's expanding. So once they reach to me, I can hear this little guy. 
So it depends on waveforms actually. Back to the Snell's law, whenever there is uh, an interface, as we said, the P wave will generate S waves, reflected S waves and reflected P waves. The angle of reflection, they're all dependent on Snell's law. So how I can get the angle of reflection? Reflection, that's a reflection for S wave. What's the, this angle? The Snell's law is also applicable here. So it equals sine of incident angle of P, P layer one. This is layer one over P, P one. That's the one. Velocity of P in layer one. This is equal to what? Sine of reflection, whatever they name it, reflection of S in layer one over Vs in layer one. So if you need to get this one, you are provided with those values, one, two, three, it easily can be obtained. So what if I say, can you get me, for example, this angle? What changes you need to make in this equation? If you are already provided with the VP and the angle of incident of VP, velocity of P wave in the first layer, and also the angle of incident in the first layer. What I can change to get S wave velocity or refracted S wave velocity? What's the value here? Who can tell me? Again, Dr. Bliss. So I'm asking you right now how I can get the refracted angle of S wave, this angle. How much is it if I'm given the VP velocity of the first layer? and the incident angle of the P wave. If I'm given this angle, incident angle of P wave, and I'm also given what the VP of first layer. What I need, what's the parameter which is needed to calculate this angle? We need uh, the velocity of the, the S velocity in uh, second layer. That's true. This is how simple is it. You just need uh, the velocity of the second layer. So the P wave, which is incident along this interface, it will generate three waves. One is a reflected P wave, and the other one is transmitted, transmitted P wave. And also generate S wave. S wave have then its own two modes. One is called a reflected S-wave, the other one is a refracted S-wave. This is a normal refraction. These two refractions are normal. But critical refractions happens whenever the refraction angle of P-wave in the second layer is 90 degree, exactly. That's what we call critical refraction then this angle whenever this total angle of the p wave refraction is 90 if the angle of refraction for p is 90 this angle is named critical angle critical angle specific angle because it lets the refracted P wave in the second layer to move in parallel with the interface at 90 degree. You need to consider something in here as well. So in whenever the velocity of the, for example, let's get only P waves, P wave in the first layer and also the P wave in the second layer, which layer has a higher velocity, one or two. 
basically to have a higher velocity. So whenever the velocity of the second layer is higher than the velocity of the first layer, the ray gonna be refracted away from the normal. That's the normal, this line. It's normal, why I call it normal? It's normal on the interface. It's making 90 degree with the interface. This is the interface between two layers. So what we see usually that this angle, refracted angle is greater than the incident angle. Whenever the velocity of the second layer is higher than the velocity of the first layer. It's the opposite in case if the velocity of the second layer is lower than the velocity of the first layer. So the a refracted P wave will move toward the normal. Let me call some names randomly. I think I just got your names. Goes. Okay, let me call. Mukhtar. Mukhtar, ayo. Mukhtar. Yes, doctor. I just need to call you. <laughs> so is it clear what I said? Do you have any questions so far? By the way, P wave generate S waves only at oblique angles. Doctor? Yes. Can you repeat how the critical angle will form? Yeah, so we're coming soon to this topic. What is critical when it's formed and how it's formed? So I'm just getting you there. Let me to point us because I'm not able to move forward. So this is an explanation of previous slides. So we'll get uh, refractions and we get refractions. They are all uh, governed by Snell's law. The reflection angle is always, the P wave reflection angle is always equal to the reflect incident angle. And all waves actually, they refract and reflect. We are right now considering only seismic wave, light reflects. Right doesn't, usually does not create diffractions. It's away from the slides, but light, uh, light waves, Usually they are high, very, very high frequencies. And that's the reason they does not create diffractions. Question does not come in exam or quizzes, but this is a general knowledge. And that's the reason if there is a small, like a hole in the wall, even the other side is shiny and you're not pointing your laser into the hole, still this, go, uh, this area gonna be dark. Victor, let's try again, we'll get. Uh, I explained it, but uh, let me explain it in uh, probably Arabic. Dutch. So he said, and the front acts as a new source يعني بيرسل موجات بنفسه كل اتجاه ف they either can interfere or interfere destructively or constructively they are moving forward each wave is generating its each point it's generating its own waves if it's homogeneous the area if the area is homogeneous as the assumption we made right now, the wave will propagate forward homogeneously in or with the same speed in all directions because uh, the, the medium is uh, uniform, is homogeneous. So the wave move in every direction at the same speed. And it fo moves forward. Yani, let me show you, let me some, do some two examples. 
let me assume that there is this barrier and there is a point here which is sending wave front in all direction once they hit here they go like that they go straight like that but these points these points they are generating their own wave fronts this one also this one also and this point here let me change the colors so you see those locations i lost my mouse this one oh let me make it red So here, there is a new point right now. There are many points. Actually, just let's consider one point. This one is generating new waveforms. This one is generating new form waveforms, and so on. So the wavefront start propagating, moving in all directions. In some parts, they might, in here, for example, they might interfere destructively. And that's how it moved forward. And this is actually what's happening. Yeah, and whenever I make a shaking in something, even though this is big, but it's connected. مثلا يعني خلينا نقول نعطيكم مثال هذا اللابتوب يعني هذا اللابتوب خلينا نقول إنه موصل بشيء حاد مع حاجة ثانية. If I do shaking here very hard and you are touching that part, the extension to it, you will feel the shaking there too. The shaking start moving in all directions and start moving through this route. Let's assume that there is a route connecting this laptop with something else. If you are touching that other thing, whatever is it, you will feel the shaking. Why? Because the waveform is expanding in every direction, moving through this uh, route in a high, following Huygens principle, creating diffractions, and the energy moves in the other part. Yeah, the energy might not be as strong as we observed it here because the distance is farther away and many part of the energy have been lost in the way is that clear that simple is it yes doctor doctor yes هل هذا نفس اللي يسمى بالحيود ولا يختلف yes that's the same yeah I think you have studied that in uh, back in school. Am I right? Yes. Yes. Let's move forward. Here is the thing. At some specific angle, which is called critical angle, the refracted ray moves parallel with the interface. So the angle of this one is 90. The angle to the normal of this uh, this one is 90 degrees. And sine of 90 is how much? Is 1. So this becomes what? 1 over V2. And they can easily get then Snell's law. Well, sorry, not Snell's law, uh, critical angle. That's the critical angle. This is what we call critical angle. After the critical angle, if there is another ray moving this direction, most of the energy will not be refracted, will be reflected. So anything beyond the critical angle, most of the energy is refract, or sorry, reflected back to the surface. So this is a reflection. 
whereas any energy hitting the interface at an angle lower than the uh, the critical angle mukhtar please just switch off your mic because yeah thank you anything any ray hitting the interface below the critical most of it will be uh, refracted will be transmitted to the lower la layers and this is how actually you can get uh, the critical angle so it depends only on what on the velocity of respective layers top and bottom layers and that's very simple equation you can solve So the questions we ask ourselves right now, we said it's moving parallel to the layers or parallel to the interface, but one might ask in which layer it's traveling, in the upper layer or the lower layer? Those energy which are traveling right now parallel to the interface, it's very important to know in which layer are they traveling are they traveling in the upper layers or the lower layer lower layer they are traveling in the lower layer so they are traveling actually in the lower layer and those points here each is a source which is like a particle it's generating its own waves in all directions so if i assume one here generating its own own waveforms and also the wave in here from the top it's moving something like that at, at this specific location there is a particle too and this is generating its own waveforms and these two will interfere these two particles will interfere or the waves from these two parts interfere either constructively or destructively. The constructive interference actually are the one we call them head waves. They start generating waves to the surface, what we call them head waves or wavelets. So this is how the refraction occurring. And the refraction wave are usually faster than the direct wave. So this is a direct. The direct wave is a wave that propagates directly from the source to some geophone. So if we assume that there is a geophone, a recording station, that's what we call the direct wave why the refracted rays are faster usually because they are traveling in a faster layer but at some points they will overcome the direct rays so let's assume that we have two layers and these are long distance or very long and one is traveling or let's assume that there are two road, road one and road two. Just make a simplification. There are two guys running along these roads, road one and road two. This guy, first guy started here and it's moving slowly. He's moving very slowly. This guy, he can move faster, but he has to move in this layer, the other guy. So what he what he makes he travels short distance from here to here that's short distance but within this shorter distance he's traveling slowly in the second layer he can travel very fast so at some point he will overcome the first guy because he traveled much faster in the second layer only very short distance when he traveled or uh, moved quite slowly but the majority of the path, he was very fast. So at some point, he will overcome the first guy. The most important here is the head waves. So whenever they are moving in the second layer, the waves, they generate head waves, which moves to the surface and get recorded by the geophones. 
this is all happening because of hygiene principle. If there is no hygiene principle, uh, we cannot imagine how head waves are generated. We cannot uh, make like a conclusion how the head waves are actually generated. So this is back Snell's law again. Uh, I think I explained it very easily. So at some distance, the head wave will start to appear. This is the distance at which the head waves will start to appear. So they moved from the critical angle. This is the first head wave. This distance, we call it critical distance, because before that, before, for example, if there is a Jufun here, they will not record critically refracted rays. They will record the direct rays and reflected rays. This is the direct. Those are the reflected rays. These going to be recorded because there is uh, array which can move this direction and recorded here the critically refracted rays critically refracted rays happens up after critical distance after this distance i can record refractions critically refracted waves any energy arriving or hitting this interface after this angle there is something we call it total internal internal reflection. Total re internal reflection, or they call it supercritical reflect reflections. And anything below or before this critical angle, we call it subcritical reflection. Most of the energy in this area is transmitted to the subsequent layers, whereas any energy hitting the interface after the critical angle is usually reflected back to the to the surface so let me play these videos for you i got them here i think uh, videos or oh, before that let me do something uh, go back to my For an instant, I stop sharing and I start presenting a tab. And uh, let me show it to you. Present a tab and choose its media. Do you see this one? Are you able to see this one? Yes, yes, doctor. Yes. yes. Seismic waves travel at different speeds through different materials. In this two layer model, two wave fronts leave an impact at the same time, but the lower layer is faster. When an explosion or impact occurs at or near the surface, waves travel away in all directions. In a uniform medium, they would travel straight paths away from the source. Waves react to the boundary according to Snell's law. When going from fast to slow media, the ray path is refracted or bent toward vertical, but bends toward horizontal when going from a slower to a faster material. When the rays are refracted 90 degrees from normal, they travel along the boundary in the fast layer. Ray paths aimed at a layer at more than the critical angle will have all the energy reflected back to the surface. This is known as a supercritical angle. Rays that strike the boundary at less than the critical angle are called subcritical ray paths and have most of the energy refracted to travel at a shallower angle in the fast layer with less energy reflected upward. The critical angle marks the angle where the wave is refracted parallel to the boundary and travels along the upper surface of the fast layer while sending a series of rays known collectively as a head wave back to the surface at the angle of the initial direct wave.
When we look at all the waves, we see that a wave traveling along the critical ray path can actually reach a geophone before a direct wave traveling a shorter path in the slower layer. Here at least, you see which one is arriving first. The refracted, these are the head waves. They will arrive to the surface before the direct rays because they traveled in the second layer with a faster speed. Let me play another media. So these are what we call head waves. Why they are generated, why there is move, uh, a head wave moving up? Because each particle here is generating its own wave. The particle along these interfaces, they are creating new waveforms, new wavelets. So all of these geophones, the first arrival was the, the direct. You see, uh, the blue one was the first arrival for all these geophones up to 70. But And uh, let me play the last video. It's just an animation without sound. So what you are seeing is that the ray are actually, uh, the refracted ray is arriving at some point earlier than the direct waves. Those are available in your uh, videos. Let me, have you seen these all? Have you seen all of these videos or missed one of them? Guys. Okay. Uh, just the first one, I think. You have seen only the first one? Yes, the, the, the screen was freezing. Really? Let me, <laughs> let me do it very quick. Okay. Let me do it very quick, but uh, you saw the first one. Uh, you should have talked to me. A tab, media two. This is media two. Explosion, the seismic signal on path A will travel in. After a shallow explosion, the seismic signal on path A will travel entirely in the upper slow layer as ray B heads toward a velocity boundary at the contact of an underlying faster layer. Path B will approach the boundary at a critical angle, speed up along the boundary, and peel off head waves at the previous angle and velocity back toward the surface. So a this is again what we said about head waves. Why there is waves generating? Is there any sources there at this point? Is there someone who is doing a hammering at this point? No. So why those waves are generated? From where are they coming? They are coming because of Huygens principle. Huygens states each point is acting, is acting actually as a new source of energy. 
So the energies generated start moving upward passes 50 meters when the first reflected B ray reaches the surface at about 25 meters. Ray B reaches the 80 meter station before A. That's because the refracted wave traveled most. So all of these stations that, or dewphones, they recorded the direct wave as the first wave to be arrived. Whereas station 80 and beyond, they are having the refracted wave as the first wave. So maybe the critical angle or critical distance is starting at 80. What's the critical distance is the distance at which the refracted energy start appearing. Before this distance, I'm not seeing the uh, refracted energy. It's not the first arrival. So this was number two. Uh, I close this one. Let me share you the last one. The last one is. Uh, is very simple. Present top. And that's the media. Again, this is only an animation without like someone. It has some sound effects only. This Jufun is the first one to start receiving a refracted energy from layer two. This is the second layer. I hope that uh, this is quite clear. This is just some animation explaining what we already discussed. Uh, you have seen all of this. Let me ask you a quick question before we stop for today. So here I'm having two medium, medium one and medium two. Two. Let's assume the source here is generating seismic waves and there is a diffraction. That's what you see here is a diffraction. This is the normal to the diffraction. If I draw a line, this is the normal to the diffraction. This is what we call incident angle I or uh, um, they call it incident angle or I just name it I theta I. And this is, oh, here it's the reflected, oh, sorry, refracted angle. Which one you think is higher? Which angle have a, is higher? First Incident. or second? Medium one. Incident. Incident is higher. So if I ask you which layer has a higher velocity? The medium one. Medium one has one. a higher velocity because the ray, the refracted ray, is bending toward the normal. It would have bent away from the normal if the velocity of the second layer is higher than the velocity of the first layer. So we'll continue with the head waves the next lecture and we'll uh, see how to do some real analysis. This is what they do real analysis. So this is the direct wave. This is the diffracted or refracted ray. That's what you see here is the refracted wave. And that angle here is what we call critical angle. Oh, sorry, critical distance. So they plot the, uh, the time with distance. But Victor, back at the lab or the key? Bukra lab, yes. No, no. Tomorrow we'll have a lab. We'll continue with reflection the next week. We'll have a reflection for two weeks. And in the next week, we have uh, a lab with a reflection technique. So the lab is similar to what you see here. Quite similar to the image you are seeing here. And it has great applications there. Yeah. Uh, the earthquake monitoring center in our university, we have 
a center called Eat Quick Monitoring Center. Um, they did a lot of work, like for, let's say, um, DOCOM area. In DOCOM area, they tried to find best place to make a tank on the surface. And also places where they want to build long story buildings. For those cases, our investigation is to find at least what is the velocity of rocks, how strong the rocks. Usually, if the P wave is like below, uh, let's say 800 or 900, the rock is loose. The layers are loose. What's the velocity of P wave in water is 1,500 meters per second. So if I need a hard ground, a solid ground, a tough rock to make my foundations on, I need to build on where? I need to build on some rock which have velocity above 250, not 2,500 or 2,500. So, or even above 3,000 meter per second. I remember there was a case to the court. And some guy raised the court, uh, to raise the case to the court. Why? Because the earthquake monitoring uh, guy or the center working in the earthquake monitoring center people, they went nearby his home and established a station, a jufun, a big jufun. And the guy made a complaint to the court that my building started cracking. Why it started cracking? No one know. But his claim was that those guys from um, Sultan Qaboos University, they came and did some investigation. The jufuns we have does not generate waves. It's just listening to the waves. It's not a jufun, it's a... Uh, a um, or they call it seismometer. It's a big, expensive instrument. We are just listening to distal earthquakes. And when we went there, did some investigation using seismic refraction, we found that the rock is quite loose. The rock he used for the foundation is very loose. So we asked him, the bedrock is very slow, uh, very uh, like the velocity of the bedrock is very, very slow. So from where you got those rocks, from where you br brought this mud, it's actually like a mud, not rock. He said, yes, there was a high slope near my, my, nearby my building. So I raised it up. I brought sand from somewhere else and dumped them there. Dumped them before he start constructing his home and later on when the mud or the sand he dumped there started getting saturated there was some cracking with the building and whenever uh, have you heard of any uh, there are two towers in malaysia i'm not sure the name of those towers have you heard of them do you know them big long towers connected together once they were the longest towers before like uh, Burj, uh, Burj Khalifa. When they started, yes, when it started, Twin Towers, their name is Twin Towers. Yeah, that's true. When they started constructing them, there is a video on YouTube. They stopped for one or two years. They stopped doing anything. Why? Because they haven't made any, ge any geophysical investigation before starting the construction. And they found that one of those buildings, there were there are two. One of them is actually in very soft material. Below the ground, there was an old lake or wadi or uh, what they call, river. Not big river, but small wadi or channel. So what they did next time, they said, we need to do geophysical investigation to see what is the thick up to the bedrock. And the first topmost layer is soil. It's soil, loose material, have low velocities. The deeper ones are thick, hard rock, foundation rocks usually. 
and I need to give them. I need to build my foundation, home foundations on top of those rocks, especially if it's like a very important building or very tall building. So what they did, they made very large drilling. And instead of putting the foundations in the soil, they drill deeper into the hard rock and dig uh, their foundation within that hard rock. It's available in YouTube. Back to the docum, what he did, he, yeah, and Dr. Isa, uh, he's the earthquake monitoring center director. He got a lot of money for SQ. And he, whenever he's doing some survey for any company, he's asking for like 10,000, 15,000. For how long? For just a week or two. They do, they go do the survey and they get 10,000, 15,000, 20,000. SQ actually take a share of it and it's 40% for the SQ and 60% for him. Most of the time they were using seismic refraction technique investigating the velocity of the rocks and from those profiles velocity profiles they decide whether the rock is good to build the foundation on or not especially big uh, building very important building or tall building so we'll do some uh, analysis which are based on seismic refraction technique. So we'll try to pick the seismic uh, refracted energy. We try to pick, get it, contain it, analyze it. That's during the lab. Uh, you might be upset with the quiz, probably. <laughs> I'm myself upset. I haven't thought that the grades uh, or the average, I thought the grade, um, average might be above 12, probably. But it's shocking to me. I take three out of four quizzes, the best uh, three you perform in. So it's not the end of uh, you to make a decision right now. Wait, see how you perform, at least in the midterm. And after all, this is a mandatory course. It's a core cool course for you, so you have to finish it at one time, except for those who are thinking to continue or not to continue with the course. Uh, maybe it's like an idea for me to evaluate you right now in week four. So make the quizzes better direct rather than indirect. Some of the qu uh, the questions probably were indirect. Um, they are not complex, but they are like um, tricky. You does not know usually which one is the right answer. So we'll stop here. We'll continue next week on seismic refraction or seismic technique. Not ref not reflection. This is refraction. Uh, some questions are too specific. Uh, I think the results are released. If you go back, you get a feedback. So if you go back to module, you'll find which answer is the right answer, where you made mistakes. And if there is anything you are not happy with, you are not, uh, and you think my decision is wrong, please refer back to me. I received a question from someone to give us a bonus because something was wrong. So since nobody got 15 out of 15, nobody, I think, got 15 out of 15, everyone receives a bonus point. So the one who got 13 will be, uh, I assume that he's got uh, 14 and so on for the rest. The gram mistake was simple mistake. Maybe because some of you are not in uh, Google Hangouts, but please, it's simple application. It helps me a lot. Uh, the first time I gave students a quiz, uh, I asked the students all to present in Google Meet and everyone started talking. The quiz was short. Uh, so everybody was annoyed. 
that's the reason it let you do it yourself without being present with me in Google Meet. I prefer to use like then Google Hangouts because you can log in using your phone and see the answers. Everybody prefers to use his laptop or desktop computer to uh, answer the quiz, whereas your phone can be used for questions, for feedback, for probably any mistakes I make, uh, grammar mistake or any other mistake or an update I announce. And this happened to me last time when I gave some quizzes. A student said, we are not following along with you. You need to follow along with me at least. You are not in different world while you are doing um, the quiz. It's an official quiz. So you need to see the updates from my side. And Google Hangout is a simple application we are using right now. I need to stop here. If you have question, please ask me right now. If you have any questions, guys, at least related to seismic reflection. I might ask some of you to volunteer helping, helping me to do seismic reflection survey. And I will go to the field, uh, do seismic refraction survey, and I need a couple of you to come along with me. Uh, I record, I record it. Not, I'm not sure when exactly. Uh, I'm thinking that probably one day we'll come back to SKU. So I prefer to have. Uh, the feed for all of you, you will enjoy it a lot. You start doing hammering, you do, we will do more than one feed work then. And you, some students will be doing seismic refraction, some of them will be doing a resistivity survey probably, others will be doing graffiti survey, uh, but I'm not sure when, and are we gonna be back to SKU or not? It's good opportunity, at least for those who are from petroleum engineer, because uh, most of the time they go either their field work is in uh, in oil fields, not real task as or not uh, field exertions as geologists or geophysicists do. You have any questions so far? So we'll let you know when exactly it is. not having any questions so first of all I stop the recording